So I'm going to list a few of the topics. Um, well, the topics for this exam. Yeah. I want to say kind of the same, the same like six. Um, so probably, well, sort of two for you from each chapter that we've covered so far. Um, <clears throat> So from linear programming problems, um, <clears throat> there are three main, well, there are, there are three topics one should know is, is how to convert um, a linear programming in standard form. And, you know, what are the advantages? I mean, the advantages you can then uh, apply simplex method. Um, but of course, you can actually do it in um, different forms and canonical form. And then in 2D, you can use graphical method, for instance. What that word? Canonical form. What's, what's, what's canonical form? So to maximize subject to you know if you have only if you have inequality constraints ax less than or equal than b and you maximize a linear function that basically corresponds to that picture that you have you know you have Well, not always. It depends on how A and B are, but um, canonical form would, would, would really mean, would basically correspond to um, the um, vertex, finding the vertex in the simplex, you know, that is kind of hit first by the level sets, the level curves, uh, the uh, the level planes, the hyperplanes, um, given by the objective function. Okay, so that's the canonical form. Of course, this this shows up also when you talk about the dual. Remember when we first talked about dual, what did we say? The easiest kind of relationship is between this and this dual because you can just, well, there we had to minimize versus maximize. So this would be y, b, subject to x, a, greater than, um, greater than or equal than c, y positive, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. That's the whole point. Okay. So in this problem, we're not to assume that it's right. Okay. So that's that's the whole in, in problem like, problems on like, like number two. Um, you're missing one. So problem number two looks just like that. Of course. Maximizing or minimizing, it just put a minus. So that's not a, the issue. The issue is that you're missing the constraint, which means, really, it means that this inequality constraints could actually give a simplex that's not just in the first quadrant, right? So how do you write the dual to that? And that's why you always want to make the, give the, start with the relationship between and the, the, the a primal and a dual 
either in canonical form or so this is in canonical form in the standard form what's the standard form? minimizing cx subject to ax equals b of course different a's different b's different c's and still x positive right with the dual what's the dual to this problem maximize y times b subject to y a plus equal than c that's it no constraints on y and again <clears throat> to make this consistent you should say y is is a row right x is a column but no constraints on y yeah <coughs> so has anybody thought about problem number two before seeing my solutions there's a very quick solution to number two if you realize what Problem number two looks a lot like, like a dual of the standard problem. Term that make a dual is a primal. Exactly. So the primal in problem number two looks a lot like the dual of a problem in standard form. So all you'd have to do is you'd have to write which standard form kind of takes you to this dual, right? And here you'd have to minimize instead of maximize, and you have any the sub the constraint is the same. So automatically you see that the dual to problem number two will have a constraint y greater than or equal than zero, and then it will have an equality constraint y a equals something. Okay. Hmm. Now, there's one thing that you may actually be kind of um, saying, I mean, here I have yb, and you know, our problem is, is the opposite, is c times x, right? So does that actually really matter? I mean, principle, it doesn't matter, because in the end, you think about it, these are m constraints, so you can always right in terms of transpose, if you like. You always think of transpose. So in that sense, you can, with this dual, you can think it now as a primal problem, and then you can go back and show that the dual of this is that. Okay? And that's basically problem number two was, was asking. Show that the dual to this is a primal. Now, We'll talk about part B in a second. But um, I think what we did is when we said that the dual of the dual is a primal, we, we just did it for, for the canonical form, where it was really clear, right? I mean, what do you do here to show that the dual of this is that? You just put minuses everywhere, right? And you make it look like a primal, and then you just change the signs and you're going to get exactly the original fun the original inequalities okay but in the end it doesn't matter in what form the pri the, pr the primal problem looks like you write the dual the dual of the dual is the primal okay okay so let's say you don't i mean how do you do it if you don't recognize that the problem the primal problem in number 2 is already the dual of a standard form so how do you do it from scratch? You try to bring this 
in either standard form or canonical form, right? I think it's easiest to bring it in canonical form because why? Because you already have the inequality constraints, you just don't have x positive. So how do you make from something that's positive or negative to something that's positive? You just write x as being x1 minus x2. I mean, each variable x, you write it as the positive part minus the negative part. Okay? So that's, I have one of my solutions. If you look at that. Of course, x1 and x2 are themselves column vectors. Right? So, I mean, it may be hard to follow like what I wrote because maybe you would just write, instead of I use tilde for x, you may think of something else. But in the end, if you have <clears throat> if you have this constraint, right? Then how can you write this as a as an equality constraint where where you have also the x being positive, the some some variables being positive, same as as this, right? And now it's just a matter of of writing this set of inequalities like you know inequalities involving x1 and x2. And that's when you do a minus a x1. So you put x1 and x2, those variables x1, the positive parts of x, the negative parts of x, as so basically it's a column twice as long, twice long, right? Is that right? I don't understand why you wrote a minus a. This is this is the matrix A and augmented with the matrix negative A, opposite A. Yeah. And now the rows. So the rows are twice as long, right? Times these columns, which are twice, which is also twice as long, leads you to what? A x one minus A x two, right? And of course, this is still less than B. I mean, this, right? Because you have the same number of columns. I mean, you have the same col the same number of columns as before. Excuse me, of rows, the same size, the same size column here. As you did before, right? So that's how you write. So this is going to be the new matrix, A tilde, if you want. Did I use A tilde? I used A one. I should have used A tilde, I guess. And this is X tilde. So that's how you create that, those constraints. That's how you write it in the standard form, in the canonical form. Then all you do is you just flip the signs, flip B with C, and you get the dual, right? And what 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 happens when you write a dual? So the dual will have. Now forget the objective. Just the dual will have y a tilde less than probably c tilde because c is going to change also, which is c and minus c. And y positive. Okay. And what happens when you do y, when you multiply a row which has the original number of constraints, right? Same, same, so it's not twice as big. But now you multiply it as a row to the left of this matrix, well, the row is going to hit the columns, right? So you're going to get twice as many inequalities. I'm sorry, this is greater than or equal to. <clears throat> the dual, right? So this means that y a is greater than c and y minus a is greater than negative c, so which or y a is less than c. 
right? So you get ya equals c. So you get the equality constraint that you wanted. If so, basically now this this is a standard form, right? So you 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 show that the dual is actually a standard form of of a LPP. Um, the only thing that we ignored was what the objective function in the primal problem. So in our problem it was minimizing c x, right? So really. With this inequality, you want to make it maximizing something with an equality less than or equal to, to have it in canonical form. So you really want maximizing, of course, minus negative c times x, right? So we're everywhere here, it should be negative c instead of c. So that's why it's negative. So y a plus c equals zero. So that's the um, that's the dual problem. This and y positive, and you maximize y times. B or y times negative B. Why do you maximize y times so this is maximizing y times B or y times negative B? Let's say we're minimizing something subject to these constraints. We're maximizing this, so in, in place we're going to minimize, instead of maximizing dual, we're going to minimize y times b. Minimize y times b. Yeah, and it's the same thing. So it's minimizing y times b. No, not maximizing. We're minimizing. Right? Because here we, we convert it to canonical form where we maximize subject to this inequality. So the dual is going to minimize subject to the opposite inequality, which turns out to be an equality in that case. I think in my solutions I went just a little bit. Um, I, I try to make the problem number two uh, to look like a minimization subject to an equality greater than or equal to. But you, you're led to the same, the same problem here. So again, the question is, I mean, how can you actually get other um, like, what other possibilities might occur if you have, like, in what shape or form can an LPP appear that you would then need to, to bring, uh, to, to compute a dual?
Well, how about a problem like, like, like number uh, one? What if you have to compute the dual of this problem? What would you do? You have a maximize over pretty much it is it is in the canonical form, right? form, right? You're maximizing a uh, linear expression subject to less than or equal inequalities and x1, x2 are positive, right? So that's kind of like a form. Has the dual we can just we can just write it. Minimizing what? Five by one plus seven y two plus 9y3 subject to <coughs> y1 plus y3 greater than or equal than 2 y2 plus y3 greater than or equal than 1 and y1, y2, y3 positive right? because you multiply the y's with the, you know, from the left with this metrics. So what's the metrics? One zero 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 one zero zero one one zero, right? I'm sorry, just one one. One zero zero one one one. So you multiply to the left y, you get y1 plus y3, and then y2 plus y3. And instead of less than or equal to greater than or equal, right? So the first problem right there was the max. That's canonical form. That's standard, canonical form. Standard form would be minimize. It would be, yeah, to minimize, but you would have equality constraints. And that's what it's, an, you know, you look at the solution. To apply simplex method, you have to convert this to canonic, to standard form. And that's done there. It introduces the slack variables to make equality rather than inequalities. When you're finding the dual, you can either do it this way or you can make it standard first. And then from the standard, you would go, yeah. That would be the long way, really. Because in the end, I mean, in the end, you, you're going to get this inequalities. I mean, you're going to get this y has to be positive. So if you go through the standard form and then take the dual, initially you won't have those y's restricted, right? But they will be because the, this matrix is going to be a lot bigger. When it transpose, you know, that's in effect is going to give you that y1, y2, y3 are positive. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's. So that that's that was easy because the uh, the this LPP is given in canonical form. But let's say it's it's not. Let's say it's um, how about maximize two x one plus x two subject to let's say um, x one plus x two. equals 9, x1, oh, I'm sorry, let's keep the order, same order, x1 plus less than 5 and x2 less than 7, but no restriction on x. And what's the dual? No, 
No? Right? What's the feasible region here? Well, for, for the previous one, you have it in the, in the picture, right? But here is like this, this, and this. So it's... It's much bigger than the feasible region of the first problem, right? So what's the what's the um, I mean? Don't take me wrong. The the objective. If we keep the objective the same, right? We just let the feasible set to be bigger. I mean, maximizing. <coughs> if it's achieved, it was achieved at this at this point. Before it will be achieved at this point also, right? But the dual problem has a much restricted. It has a restricted, uh, much smaller set. In fact. It's an, e it's an equality constraint, right? The dual to this is an equality involving y1, y2, y3. So it is actually the feasible set for the dual is actually a, in that plane. It's in a plane, right? Not only the plane, but it's also in the first octant. Because y's have to be positive. So the question of this being f having a solution is the same as saying, is that plane in the first octant? If Remember, the dual and the primal are feasible at the same time. I mean, have non-empty feasible sets at the same time. So the dual is... And now we have to be a little bit careful because, yeah, I think, I mean, you'd have to, you have to really kind of replace each variable with the positive and the negative part and do that. So I'm, I'm a little bit kind of uh, cautious here to say that it is what is, it seems to be, but let's just give it a shot. Subject to y1 plus y2 equals 2. Y1 plus y3, y2 plus y3 equals 1, right? Y1 positive, y2 positive. So, sorry, I was a little bit. So it's not that we're, we're not, uh, the feasible set for the dual is not a plane. intersect with the first octant. But in fact, it's a line. It's this. It's just a line in the first octant. Okay? So that's the part two in problem number two asking. In problem, in problem number two in the, in the sample, uh, the, the part two says the following. It says, um, do I have a, a non-empty feasible region? So, right, when I enlarge, you know, if I enlarge the feasible set for the primal problem, you're restricting the feasible set in the dual problem. Because you're getting equality constraints. Okay? Subject to double checking. I just kind of listed there, but I think that's true. Yeah, I think that's true. Because the numbers have to come up from, from somewhere. They just have to be... Right? And I think we can actually verify from, from problem number two. If we, instead of maximize, we minimize, we have minus Cs, negative 2, negative 1. Right? 
and then in the dual is just minimizing B so that's the correct B subject to the equality constraints Y times A plus C but C is minus C so it's yeah so that's true based on the uh, problem number two mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Sorry, I just. Thanks. Yes. <coughs> so it's really a line intersect intersection of these two planes. You know, it, you, you can have two planes intersect in a line, it has nothing to do with the first octant. So that's the whole thing. It does it intersect, is it in the first octant? So in problem number two, part two, that's exactly what it says. It says that if we know, so in number two, part two, it basically says this. It says if there is y in the first octant, you know, whatever dimension it is, uh, with with the which is feasible for the dual problem okay then what's the conclusion the primal problem is also feasible which means it has an optimal value Right? This means that the dual problem is feasible. It means that the primal problem is feasible. So the feasible sets are not empty. Yeah? Now, what was the feasible? What was, uh, just for simplicity, let's take B to be zero. Then what's the feasible set? It means as a set when AX is less than or equal than zero, he is non empty. Okay? <coughs> and generally it was AX less than or equal than B. But here is AX less than or equal than zero. This is non empty set. Okay. So, um, so under this assumption, you have both the primal and the dual to be feasible. And what's the the nice thing about this? Again, remember, sometimes it's easier to check that, like these inequalities are consistent, right? Here you have a set of inequalities, homogeneous inequalities. You can say whether they are uh, well, x equals zero would satisfy that anyway. So maybe I'm wrong, but what is this? What is this saying that the the dual is minimizing zero times y times zero, which is zero, subject to you know, y a plus c equals zero and y positive. If b is zero, so if b is zero, your objective function is zero. So the optimal is zero, right? Any feasible set, any feasible solution here is optimal. Any feasible solution for the dual is optimal because it gives the value zero it's zero times right so by duality you know what by duality
but it was still minimizing. Sorry, it was minimizing. Subject to. Well, the minimum is sub is zero because that's the optimal value for the dual. Subject to a x less than or equal than zero. What does that basically say? It basically says that c x is always at least. It means that if AX is less than or equal than zero, that implies CX is, is greater than or equal than zero. And again, this conclusion is simply um, drawn from solving y a plus c equals zero. That's a that's a equality. That's a system of equations that if you can solve and y's are positive, that tells you that the primal problem has minimum zero, and every uh, feasible solution of the dual is optimal. Okay, so it was just an up. It's basically an up, uh, illustration of the uh, duality theorem here. So, what would be other other situations where you um, you you might see this kind of argument here? Um, Well, one one situation could be the following: could be um, find the dual to the problem minimization of a uh, of c x subject to say a x less than or equal than uh, b and x less than or equal than some upper bound and some lower bound. You know, how do you how how does that translate in the dual? So maybe x is restricted to some interval rather than positive. you can always change this to maximizing, right? So that's not a... So you're maximizing this subject to this inequality, right? But then you have additional inequalities. So what can you do? You'd have to write x minus l less than or equal than 0, right? And well, basically x less than or equal than l, and negative uh, x less than or equal than negative l, right? Little l and capital L. <coughs> so you would then convert it to a matrix where you have a, and then you have identity and you have negative with identity. Right? It means A Well, these are no different than these constraints. So you just want to put it as a one block constraint. So you're going to put it, so you're going to put um, B tilde t 
to be B, what else? L and negative L, right? You know, those three sets of constraints would become just what? A tilde X less than or equal than B, right? Represents all the constraints, right? AX less than or equal to B, X less than or equal to L, negative L, negative L, right? So now you've 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 uh, you've come to a situation like in the problem number two, where you have maximizing or minimizing subject to just a set of inequality constraints, right, with no x positive or negative. So what will be the the dual? Now that we kind of know that we're going to have to have it something in a standard form. Let's say let's say I'm going to change this a little bit to maximizing c times x so that now it looks in canonical form well not in canonical form but it looks the dual to a standard form right the dual to a standard form is always maximizing subject to less than or equal to yeah and no x no x positive or negative so if we maximize this then the dual is can somebody tell me what it is? Minimizing B Y B subject to <clears throat> Y A tilde equals C and Y positive. Yeah, because I changed it to maximizing C X. If it was minimizing CX, it would be maximizing a negative CX, and that would be negative C. Yeah? So, and now what you do? You just write what is, well, Y is going to be consisting of, there's going to be a first, there's going to be three blocks, right? Not three blocks, three rows, or three pieces of the row. You could, Y1, Y2, Y3. In fact, if you let me change this, I would put capital L, little l, y tilde here. Because remember, B, you know, B is a column like this, so Y is going to have three comp three parts. So what was B? B was the original B, so Y tilde B tilde is YB plus YL times L, right? Plus Y little L times negative L. So basically that's what you're going to have to minimize. Yes? Hmm? Because uh, this is a standard form with equality constraints and, and positive components. The dual of this loses that uh, positiveness, but it gains the less than or equal to. So, so the dual will look just like this. I'm sorry, will look just like this. And no positiveness on, on x's. You have, to, you have to remember what the dual of the standard form looks like. It looks like this is replaced by just the inequality. Maybe I should write here again. We're maximizing Cx subject to 
So this is maximizing CX subject to. Okay. So just to finish, uh, you would get that this is this is the what you minimize subject to the constraints are what tilde a tilde equals c. So that's y a tilde is a plus y l times the identity plus y little l times the negative opposite the negative identity equals c. So it's basically and y positive, y l positive, y little l positive. So it's going to be, so let's just wrap, wrap it up. It would be minimizing y b plus y l times l plus y little l times or minus times l subject to to what? Y A plus Y capital L minus Y little L equals C and Y positive, Y L positive and Y little L positive. Okay. So if you think about like MATLAB in that the way it was uh, syntax, you can allow lower bounds and upper bounds, right? If you have lower bounds for all uh, variables and upper bounds for all variables, then <clears throat> um, that problem should be set up. I mean, the dual of that problem is exactly uh, of this type. If some of the lower bounds are missing or upper bounds are missing, that means some of this y else will be missing. So it's, it's a different, it would be a different formulation than this. This is when all lower bounds are finite and when all our upper bounds are finite. Yep. When we do this problem, can you scroll up a bit? Mm -hmm. When we do this problem, we make all the substitutions, the a tilde, the b tilde, and then we write the dual. <coughs> mm-hmm. You have to explain it one more because a tilde is is sort of made of so we, lots of identities. Okay, so we make the substitution above, then we do that. So we actually need to finish right. all the substitution. So, I mean, this is this is a general, but in, in for example, let's let's just take an example. Let's say maximize two x one plus three x two plus four x three subject to I don't know, some inequality constraints, x2 um, plus x3 less than 5, x4, uh, no x4, x1 plus minus 2x2 less, well, let's even put an equality, equals um, 2 and x1, 0, 1. I mean, this may be infeasible, but okay, no constraint on x2, but constraint on x1 of this type. Maybe not zero one, but maybe okay, this zero one. Just so it is a little bit different than when you have cons uh, bounds for b all variables. <clears throat> so how would you how would you convert this to, for instance? How do you find the dual to this? Hmm? One would be to change this, make all of this look, look like inequalities with less than or equal to, right? And not x1 positive or x1, x, you know. That would be one way to do it. And then use, so it could be, the so same problem with the constraints are x2 plus x3 less than 5 x1 minus 2x2 less than 2 and 
the opposite, right? Remember an equality? You do it, you can replace it by two inequalities, right? And what else? x1 less than or equal than 1, right? And minus x1 less than or equal than 0. Okay? Then what you can immediately say what? Based on this problem number 2 that we just we did. Dual is minimizing How many variables are you going to have? Five, right? So you're going to have five y1 plus two y2 minus two y3 plus y4, right? Subject to <coughs> y2 minus y3 plus y4 minus y5. Great. Equal. Okay, equal. That's, that's the point, right? Equal, whatever that was, 2, and then y1 minus 2, y2 plus 2, y3 equals 3, and y1 equals 4. And y's are positive. See? So immediately you can see what? Well, y4 minus y5, you can rename this as being just uh, you know a new variable and it would be positive or negative right y2 minus y3 it's another variable right so I can use u1 for y1 u2 for y2 minus y3 and u3 for y4 minus y5 Let's see, am I missing a Y5 here? <clears throat> well, I mean, whether you move to this new uh, variables or not, if you look, if you just look back here, you can see that Y1 is already given, right? then y2 minus y3 is already given. Then y4 minus y5 is just one value, right? So you basically just, you found that feasible set to be consistent one point. Right? One point in terms of three variables here. And you can minimize you can minimize that expression based on on the, the numbers that you get for u1, e2, u3. So this is gonna be four. This is gonna be what? One. And this is gonna be one. Okay. And the other thing is, can you minimize this expression using these numbers. If you can, I think you cannot. Because you don't have a y5. That's 
You see? Actually, no, I think. You don't have a minus y5 there, so this number would be just y4, right? You minimize y4 subject to this constraint. I think you get zero because you have this inequality. So you get zero. So the minimum is zero. What does that say about the original problem? This thing is the maximum of that is zero, right? And this uh, this set of inequality inequalities is feasible, and it's probably by setting. Well, I don't know what x1 and x2 should be to give you zero. But you see, a set of inequality constraints in the primal problem turns into a set of equality constraints in the dual problem. Set of equality constraints you may actually be able to solve, right? And then you can minim you can you can solve the dual problem much easier than you do the the, the primal problem, and then just conclude what the value of the primal problem is. And I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, I, th I think that's true. I think that's. The minimization is zero. The minimum value is zero in this case. But you might want to double check. Um, problems three and four are, um, I think I worked them out in detail, so I'd recommend you look at number four just sort of um, based on the, you know, just on the KKT system. But the conclusions should be kind of um, match the picture that you have. So it's a, it's a you're trying to find the closest point uh, to the origin on a feasible region, which is given by an equality constraint and by an inequality constraint. Okay, and if you if you in this case and in you know. Um, Probably on the exam, you'll also have something that you can connect graphically, um, so that it, so that whatever you come out, you know, through your solving your KKT system, makes sense or doesn't make sense. You know, you can verify that. Um, so, you know, of course, if you have three or more variables, this becomes more difficult. But um, I think in three dimensions, you can still do that, right? So in this case, a feasible set is a intersection between a line and sort of a above of the parabola. So it's a line segment. So it's a question of how do you find the minimum, the closest point to the, that line segment to the origin. And that's why you do KKT, and you, you come up with one unique value. I mean, sometimes the unique value could be one of the ends of the line segments, right? Depending on how the line segment is compared, is uh, aligned with the origin, or is in connection with the origin. I think in this case it's an interior point, but um, and last problem is just, I mean, problem number five is just sort of, um, illustration of that. Again, the closest point to the origin, how, how can you characterize, characterize a point that is closest to, uh, a level set, like G less than or equal than zero? And notice that it doesn't have to be convex. So if, if you have a convex function, then the g less than or equal to zero would be a convex set, right? I'm, I'm way over time, but um, if g is convex, then g less than or equal to zero is convex set, right? So the picture would look like a, you know, so then if you have a point outside, how many points are you going to find that are closest to this point? Well, one, if it's strictly convex. In fact, what's the function that you, you, you optimize? Is the x minus x naught length squared. So that's a strictly convex. So it is a unique point, right? The question is, how, what's the property of this, of this unique point? Well, if you do the KKT or just the Lagrange multiplier, well, the KKT actually, the gradient points in this direction. So 
you can you can conclude how is the gradient dot you know multiplied by x minus x, x star minus x naught, positive, negative, or zero. Um, but it turns out that this is true even if it's not convex. So if it's g not convex, it could be something like a potato shape, right? The point is that you still have a point that is closest. If your point is outside this region, you'll always have a point that is closest. You may have more than one point that is closest, right? But if it is a point which is closest to this point, you again have the same scenario. And again, that's because KKT works even for non-convex situ situations. Okay, any questions, you know, uh, you can ask me after. Uh, I'll be available for another hour or so, and then tomorrow, 9 to 12.